In a day like today, I thank you that it is a day that our society has set aside to remember those who have served in our armed forces and given their lives on behalf of uh, our country and fightings. And Lord, I thank you that we have freedoms that others paid the ultimate sacrifice for us. And I do thank you for the fact that it can be set aside. May, may Memorial Day weekend be more than just a, a long weekend. May it be more than just being able to uh, have a picnic or whatever. But may we actually think about what it was designed to do, which was to remember those who have died in service. Father, I pray, though, too, that we might be reminded on days like this of servants of yours, as it were in the army of the king, who have gone to places around the world and given their lives and died either at the hand of a persecutor or just lived their life and died on foreign soil because of their love for you and the love for the lost. I thank you that they can be as well an encouragement to us as we think about where our lives will be spent. Father, I pray today for Vera's family as they mourn her loss. I thank you for the joyful uh, spirit that Scott had in talking to me and thank you for the hope of heaven that he is filled with. May you give the family that joyful thought that one day as believers in Jesus Christ will be reunited together. Father, I thank you this morning that as we sing the songs, that the words that we sing, may they be more than mere words on a page or up on the screen. But may they be things that we would sing from our hearts and learn from as well. I just ask you this morning to be glorified as we lift up your son. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning we think about and sing about our lo love for our Lord. And uh, we do that in response for what he has done for us, for our free gift of salvation, for what Christ has done on the cross for us. And I know that... Uh, that as Christians, we, we understand that. And this morning, we'd like to respond to our Lord in song during our worship today. Will you stand and turn to number 76 in the hymnal? We'll sing, Oh, for a thousand tongues. Notice the words as we sing in response and love to our Lord. Number five, my gracious master and my God. one another this morning.
find the scripture reading for this morning. If you would, pull that out as we read together. I'll read the light print, and if you would, respond with the dark. This morning we read from the book of Psalms, Psalm 107, verses 1 through 9. O give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom He has redeemed from the hand of the enemy, and gathered out of the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and He delivered them out of their distress. And He led them forth by the right way, that they might go to a city for a dwelling place. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for His goodness, and for His wonderful works to the children of men. For He satisfies the longing soul, and fills the hungry soul with goodness. This morning, as we continue to sing, let us do that. Let us give thanks to the Lord for His goodness. Let's remember the things that He's done for us in many, many different ways. Uh, please remember that as we continue this morning. You may please be seated. And we continue in our theme to give praise and, and love to our Lord. Will you turn to number, number one in your hymnal? And we'll sing, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Turn to page 106, page 106 in the, the hymnal. We sing with proclamation. We sing with our hearts. But we sing not for emotion alone, but, but in response to what we know to be true. And we know that God is good. We know that He is merciful and that He is he's gracious and offers us salvation. And in response to that, let us sing, praise Him, praise Him. Redeemer for our sins. 
Jesus the crucified sound his praises Jesus who bore our sorrows love unbounded wonderful deep and strong praise him praise him tell of his excellent greatness praise him praise him ever in joyful song very good and if you look to the screen, we'll sing Shout to the North, another call to worship. I think we'll all sing verse 1. If The men will drop out for verse 2 when the ladies sing. And then we'll all sing verse, verse 3. Thank you for your singing. Amen. Men, women, children, all of us. Let's praise the Lord together, all right? One other thing you might be praying for, we heard this week, Cliff and Sheila Patterson. Some of you, again, will remember them. Their son passed away uh, this week uh, suddenly. So if he, he was a young man, I think they said maybe 32. So you pray for them as they uh, walk through that path as well, okay? Let's pray. Father, I thank you that we could travel to the farthest regions of this world and there would be things there that would give you praise. And I would look forward to the day that we might have that great opportunity to hear of people that were actually praising your name. So I pray that even today your word would continue to go forth, go out into all the world, that the folks around the world, the sinners, the lost, would hear of their need of Christ and that they too would be able to rise up and give you praise and glory. Father, this morning I do pray for Cliff and Sheila. I pray that you would bring to them the promises that they have memorized and remembered, that they might remember that your presence will go with them always. So may they know that you are there with them even now. I pray, Father, that as we give in this offering, that it would be a reminder to us of all the great blessings you have given to us. And we have this one opportunity 
to give back to you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to sing this morning a song I enjoy singing. You know, when you get to sing, you get to kind of pick songs you like to sing, and I love this song. It doesn't really have a whole lot to do with Memorial Day. It doesn't really have a whole lot to do with uh, the time of the year, but that doesn't really matter to me. And, um, but it does speak about where our future home is. Uh, America is beautiful, and we love living in this country, but there will be a day when the Lord will graduate us on to heaven. And uh, before we get to spend it in the new heavens and new earth, we'll be in that <clears throat> new, Jerus new Jerusalem. And a few of us have had the privilege to stand in the old Jerusalem. So I just want to sing the song, The Holy City, and I want you to think about not only this Jerusalem of today, but that new Jerusalem that will come one day out of heaven to be able to, and we will inhabit the earth, all right? Just listen again to the words. Last night I lay asleep, there came a dream so fair. I stood in old Jerusalem beside the temple there. I heard the children singing, and ever as they sang, methought the voice of angels from heaven in answer rang. Methought the voice of angels.
morn was cold and still as a shadow of a cross arose upon the lonely hill as a shadow Thank you, Pastor, for that reminder of our, uh, our hope in heaven. We eagerly awake, uh, await um, to be in glory with our Lord. And the trials of life can certainly uh, remind us of our desire to be with our Lord. We do look forward to the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem. In the meantime, we have a Savior who is intimate, who knows us, and cares about us, and is involved in our everyday life, a Spirit that indwells us, never leaves or forsakes us. Let's look to the screen as, as we sing, He Knows My Name.
you know, today, the, if you open your Bible to Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to talk today a bit about what it means to have a father on, in the earth, or an earthly father, and what it means to be a child here on planet earth. But I couldn't help but think as we were singing that song, how great it is to have a father in heaven. You know, in 2001, nearly, well now 13 years ago, my father passed away in 1998. Beth's dad passed away and uh, they left us. Now, not by their own choice necessarily, but they did. And most of, some of you, your fathers are gone and but isn't it great to know that our Heavenly Father has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He will take us from this earth to be with himself. And that's why when I think about people like Vera, I'm, I'm so thankful that we truly have that kind of hope in our Heavenly Father. Well, we come this morning to again Ephesians chapter 6 and we, we're still in the section... <clears throat> on what it looks like to be spirit-filled, all the way back to Ephesians 5 and down around verses 18 and following down to 18 to 21. It's all about how we are spirit-filled people, and, or at least we ought to be, spirit-controlled, and that will work itself out in all of life. And here the Apostle Paul has been dealing with some extremely practical matters and how that will look to the world. He's talked about wives, he's talked about husbands, he's talked about Christ in the church and now he continues on in the subject of the family and he turns the attention on to two main uh, people if you will in, this, in the context and three because we see three different um, again people, I'm just going to use that phrase but I want you to come to Ephesians 6, just read with me verses 1 to 4. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, for the purpose that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Fathers, stop provoking your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. You know, some of us have been blessed to have children. And I say that honestly. Children are a blessing from the Lord. Uh, Psalm 127 says that uh, blessed is he who has his quiver full. And I never, we never figured out what a full quiver was. I, don't, I couldn't figure it out Hebraically, or, but somehow practically five must have been our full quiver, okay? Because we quivered when number five came along, and we were like, woo! I think five sounds like a great number, and because um, uh, we always kind of thought we might want half a dozen. You know that, remember the old movie, uh, what, 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 Cheaper by the Dozen? You know what? That was written in like the 1800s or something. By the time we came along, they were cheaper by the half dozen, and I'm not even sure what it would be today. But, um, but you know, five was fine for us. But as we raised our children, if you have more than one or two children, you begin to realize a very practical lesson. Here's the lesson. When there's only one, you share that one between you. Where'd he go? I've got him, her, whatever, you know. Then there's two, then you each get one. Then when there's three, it's not so bad. You've got two hands, you know, and your wife or husband has one. So you, you keep, then you get four. You still have four hands. But when number five comes, there's somebody always loose. Somebody is, there's no, you just, you can't do it. I mean, it just, there's somebody always running. And, and it wasn't always the oldest either. I read one author that put it like this. I thought this was pretty well done. He said, uh, one child makes a home a course in liberal education for both himself and his parents. Two children make it a private school. Three or more make it a campus. <laughs> I thought that was pretty good. That's just about right, you know. All of a sudden you kind of go, wow, I mean, it, it, you are for sure always learning. Well, you know, just a couple of thoughts before we actually look into this. Isn't it interesting? This was a letter written to the church at Corinth, correct? And it was to be read to the church at Corinth. Uh, Ephesus, what am I saying? You're all sitting there going, are you like, are you, 
Yeah, just, you know what, when I make a, that big of a boo-boo, uh, somebody just raise your hand and go, he's stupid. <laughs> Ephesus. And then I'll go, okay. So anyway, Ephesus. Okay, so it's supposed to be read in the church at Ephesus, right? So, you know, this is being read along in the congregational meaning of the church at Ephesus. And, well, okay, we can understand 522. Wives, submit yourself to your husbands. Because we would expect <clears throat> that there would be some wives in the service. Then when he says, at verse 25, husbands, love your wives, we could expect that there would be husbands in the service. Now, just because we have a chapter break in our Bibles, and just because it seems like maybe it, it's a little disconnected, it's actually not. Because in the congregational meeting at the church at Ephesus, Paul simply assumed there would be some children. The same as he assumed there would be wives, the same as he assumed there would be husbands, he assumed there would be children. You know, we provide a, 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 a bit of, a, a, of a, a class during the morning service for the really younger children, but it, it actually distresses me when I've been in churches where, I mean, you almost have to be an adult to be in the service. Like, you know, they got... They got meetings going on even for young people at times and I think how sad is that you know what I really don't get <clears throat> real bothered by children who aren't necessarily paying as close attention as adults in a service you know those children who like to every now and again talk out or even frankly babies at times now it gets a little you know if you're a parent and the kids go <laughs> like for five minutes get them out go stand in the in the foyer out there okay but you know what a baby crying in a service tells us we've got young families I mean I don't get overly bothered by that I love to have children in a service I've told people in all of my life in ministry, we did it with our own children, but I would say it for any child, you would be amazed at what your child will pick up in a service like this. If you say to yourself, oh, they're too young, when they're five, six, seven, eight years old, they're too young to really pick up anything. No, they will. Now, I don't expect them to have their pen taking notes, you know, or have their iPad out and, you know, following all the Greek and Hebrew words, okay? Um, but you'd be amazed at what they might now. They shouldn't have their iPads out playing games either, just to let you know that. But, um, but you know, there are times you have to have some kind of diversion. When the kids were little, I mean, they would sometimes have a coloring book or whatever. They weren't. They weren't necessarily. We, Beth did not force them to focus on dad up front. Bad enough to have to listen to him all the rest of the time. But my point is, is that kids though they pick up things. I've heard many times through the years a parent who comes to me and says, man, I couldn't believe it. My child said, and then they quote what I just said in a, in a service. And they go, I didn't even think they were listening. Well, yeah, you didn't think they were listening. And just imagine if they weren't around. Well, I just say that because if you're a young parent of young children, never fear bringing those children into this service. Evening service, Wednesday night service, Sunday morning service. Don't fear it for me. And I would surely hope no one around you would give you that evil eye if all of a sudden they realize you've got your four-year-old sitting there and you don't send them out to the children's ministry. You might want them to stay in. Now again, you know, I mean, within reason you just need to make sure that they're paying attention. But I think Paul, I mean I don't think when he said children, I don't think he was, when he said techna, he wasn't meaning well the older children the techno were born ones these could be these could have been smaller or older I, I just think it's amazing that we have come to a place in some of our services where children are persona non grata well he talks about children and and then he gives some very practical lessons now let's face it if you're a again if you're a parent and <clears throat> you're a Christian parent and you're raising your children in a Christian environment. Let's face it. You do not teach your children the first verse they ever learn is not John 3.16. Right? It is not. It is Ephesians 6.1. <laughs> what did Paul say in Ephesians 6.1? I don't know, Daddy. Children, obey your parents and Lord. Okay, okay, children, obey your parents and Lord. I mean, that's the one you want to inculcate, okay? Then you can just give them that Ephesians 6 look, you know, and then they go, okay, 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 you know. 
And then give him John 3.16 and everything else, okay? But give him, get him in there. That he, that's what we kind of do. Because we kind of think it's like a somehow an open-ended thing. If we just get them to memorize, children obey your parents, then everything's going to be fine. Oh, by the way, I'm hoping to get to verse 4 at least. I, I, again, if you read my my pastor's pen. I said I was going to share 10 things. I said that when I typed that, I went, am I actually going to get that far? But I will because I set you up to think I was going to tell you that, okay? So I'll, I'll, I'll at least share that no matter how far I get. But see, here's the deal. It's just like in the husband and wife relationship, both of them being in a, in a godly way, walking with the Lord. Husbands cannot just be dictators to their wives. Wives were not to be just uh, welcome mats to be trampled on. Children are not to be just treated as mere objects in your home. I get frustrated when I hear people say things like, Christianity has been the worst thing ever perpetrated on the world. Are you kidding me? Christianity, just the overall principles of Christianity has been the greatest thing to society because it lifted women and children out of what they, were, what they were living with in the Roman Empire. When Paul wrote this, see, we read this from the eyes of 21st century America, and we kind of say, yeah, children should be respected. There should be a Children's Day like in 1867. But children in the first century that Paul wrote in were really nothing more than mere, almost again, just like pieces of ownership. Let me read you a little bit of, just to give you an idea of what it was like in the first century as it related to these kinds of things. In the first century, children were often taught through beating which was standard in child rearing and education. Fathers were considered responsible for their education. Paul may be among the minority of ancient writers who disapprove of excessive discipline. It, not maybe, he was in the minority of that. It said Greek and Roman society was even harsher on newborn children because an infant was accepted as a legal person only when the father officially recognized it Babies could be abandoned or if deformed, killed. One author said, in the Roman society, a Roman father had total control over their children until he died. There was no emancipation at age 18 or 21. As long as a Roman father was alive, he had control over his children. Can you imagine that flying today? I mean, when you and I think about how bad society is, we are far beyond the first century into which the Christians first went. We are far beyond the culture that Paul was writing to when he said, children, obey, honor, and fathers, stop provoking your children to anger. It was a society that treated children in a very horrible way. And so Paul, writing to this church in Ephesus, not Corinth, this church in Ephesus, to many new believers, many that had come to faith in Christ out of a very pagan background, who only knew the kind of child rearing that was used with them, He's trying to help them understand what a godly child and a godly parent would look like. You'll notice in verse 1, in the Lord. You'll notice again in verse 4, of the Lord. Again, Paul's emphasis has been to that. Look at 522. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as unto the Lord. I mean, throughout this whole chapter, and this whole section I should say, Throughout this whole section, there's been, a, there's been a, a, a very focused attempt by the apostle to keep them thinking about the Lord. I mean, again, this whole matter of you as a child, me as a child first, what it means for me to uh, walk in obedience and me as a father or as a parent raising my children in obedience to the Lord. 
Notice there are two words, main words, about a child. The focus of the child is related to two particular words. Notice that number one, the first key for a child is obey. Interesting word. In the word, it has this idea, to listen. All of obedience, that word is not just used, by the way, certainly in relationship to children. It's related to all of us. But obedience presupposes that we're listening. That we actually hear what's being said. We cannot obey something that we either didn't hear or we heard incorrectly. Children are to be listeners. Children should listen to their mature adults around them because they have an experience that the child doesn't. You know, again, you can learn a lot about like, a, like a, um, an athlete by how they respond to their coach. You know, I don't think it matters how many years a particular athlete has played a particular sport. There's always something that a coach can teach them. That's why they're the coach. They sit back, they look, they analyze. And if an athlete rejects that kind of input, they're not going to last. And children need to be listeners. And in their listening, then they obey. Let me make sure I address something very quickly. Does that mean a child is expected to obey their parents 100% of the time? The answer is no. If a parent were to ask a child to do something sinful or directly against God's word, the child is to be humble and loving enough to obey God rather than man. In a church that I served in, this is not a made-up story, this is true. In one of the, it's not here, so I always like to say that, so nobody thinks, oh, let me think who it might be. But in a church I, I, I served in, there was a young gal who came to faith in Christ, a high school girl, who came to faith in a, out of a family of absolute pagans. I mean, her, her home situation was not very good. When she got saved, she really wanted to turn her life around. She, actually, she really wanted to honor God in her life. To that point in her life, she was still a virgin. To her family, that was, that was a very negative thing. They, were, they, they could not believe that this girl would not do what they had all done. So one day she came home from school... And her parents told her that they had a, a surprise waiting for her upstairs. She didn't know what it was. When she got to her room, there was a young man there that they had brought in specifically so that she would no longer be a virgin. She disobeyed her parents' will at that point. And I think she was right, obviously. Now that's an extreme case. I mean, and I honestly mean, I did not, I don't have to make that up. I, I, I still, every time I think about that, I, I, I just can't, I can't even grasp how, how wicked and pagan these parents must have been. So children, you don't have to obey parents that are, that are causing you to do something that's directly against the word of God. But then again, none of us are to obey an authority over us who want us to go against God's word. If you're in a working environment and your boss says to you, I need you to lie on this, on this report, you are not to obey them. You are to give the truth, whatever that is. So children are to obey their parents. Now notice, I want you to, there's, there's some, again, keep noticing what's going on in the passage. He says, obey your parents. That's both mom and dad. That's important for where we're going to get to in verse 4. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. You know, when you think about children and you think about their obedience or lack thereof, it's right to listen to an adult. Because children are impulsive, children 
are immature. Children don't always think through consequences. Adults don't always think through consequences either. But children are, that's just the way they are. I mean, a young four, five, six, eight, ten year old child will will not think through all the consequences of their choices and that's why they need a parent. That's why they need hopefully a godly parent to guide their life because it is right. Isn't it interesting in at least the cultures I know of and I'm no, uh, I'm certainly not an expert in world uh, cultures but I think I could be pretty well right to say every culture wants obedient children. I mean, most cultures aren't, they, they don't have courses on how to raise juvenile delinquents, right? I mean, they, they don't normally have courses on how to raise murderers or thieves or, you know, those kind, I mean, they, we don't, we don't, they don't normally have courses like that. And so I think what Paul is getting at by saying it's right is simply saying this is what's normal. It's just right. It, I mean, it's righteous. That's the, the word has the idea of it is righteous. And yes, it's certainly scriptural because that's what he says in, in verse uh, 2 and 3. Honor your father and your mother. That's, of course, the fifth commandment. As the commandments were laid out, normally we think of 1 to 5, 6 to 10. But really, if you break down the commandments, 1 to 4 are God-centered 5 to 10 are man-centered. So there are some who would say that as the law was, in a sense, if you were going to make two um, tables of the law, you'd have 1 to 4 and 5 to 10. And that may be true, but no matter what, 1 to 4 is God and, and 5 to 10 are more human. And so he quotes that, honor your father and your mother. He goes right back to the Old Testament. He takes right out of the Ten Commandments. Commandment number five, which obviously the thought of it was still a biblical reality. Honor. See, that's the second key, young people. That's the second key as a child. You need to honor your parents. It's right. It's scriptural. Look, again, I've lived long enough to realize there are some parents who aren't very honorable. There are some parents who live lives that are far from a godly life. This family that I t spoke about, I, I, th there wasn't a lot in that person's life that I would say was honorable. So the question is, well, how should I honor, if that's true of my parents, first of all, I doubt that's true of very many of you. I know your parents. I think I can look around and say that I think I know all of your parents, or at least a little bit about them. But here's the thing, even if they were, from a human standpoint, almost dishonorable, when he says honor them, there has to be something in their life that you can honor them for. You know, look deep and it may be something really small or, or it may be something that's almost hidden from view but I think based upon the fact that he says to honor them and esteem them and lift them up, I don't think it means because they are necessarily honorable people. There has to be something you can honor in that parent. Your call is to obey and honor. Notice, so that it go, will go well with you and you may live long on the earth. I mean, you know, if we were to um, begin to, if we, were be, if we would begin to look through the Bible of, to see how that played out, we could find a lot of children who whose lives were cut short because of disobedience. Children who were raised sometimes by godly moms and dads who chose to go the wrong path and their life was cut short. I think of David and Absalom. Absalom's life was cut short because of his willingness to be in rebellion against his own father. Samuel's children died young. I mean, you could just kind of start in Genesis and move along. Oh, wait. Stop. 
Oh yeah, Cain. You know, I, I'm just asking you to say, children, if you want to learn to live long on the earth, you live a life of obedience. Does that mean that if I live a life of obedience, if you choose to be obedient to mom and dad, you're guaranteed to live as old as some of us are? No, it doesn't. It doesn't mean that just because you're an obedient child, you get to say, I'm going to live into my 80s or 90s or whatever. But it does say this. There is more of a likelihood to live into your 80s if you're obedient than it is if you're disobedient. If you choose to go against godly advice especially, then don't be surprised if you die young. You know, again, this whole matter of living long, I think part of it is, is because if you, if you're being raised by godly parents and they say to you, listen, don't drink, you never have to worry about cirrhosis of the liver if you obey that. Don't drink and drive. You don't have to worry about driving your car into a bridge abutment because you're so intoxicated you can't see where you're going. If your parents say, don't steal, and you live a life of honesty, you don't have to worry about being in Sing Sing or, or San Quentin, at least for thievery. Huh. I mean, there are a lot of vices that you would be kept away from. You don't have to experience everything. It's that old illustration of your parents saying, don't put your hand on the hot stove, right? And then children go, well, why not? Well, maybe that, they're, they're keeping fun away from me. Ah! <sighs> now I know why. Think of how better your life would be without marks on your finger from the, from the stove. See, there are scars that you don't need to, you just don't need to suffer. There are paths that you don't need to go down. Trust me. Most parents that went down the wrong path and learned lessons from that could wish that they didn't go down that path. There are choices that I made as a, as a young teenager and things that I I really do wish I hadn't done. I mean, I never got into really, really bad stuff. And I praise God for that. I praise God that He protected me from a lot of things. But there are still choices and places that I did, went and things that I said. And I could wish I hadn't done it. Now, isn't it funny? Here's what we say a lot. We learn a lesson. We say this. Boy, I wish somebody had told me earlier and I wouldn't have done it. I dare say if you'd had a tape recorder running and you could go back and like scan that tape recorder, I'll almost bet somebody told you, that's not a good idea. Probably shouldn't do that. There's probably somebody that told you not to do it. And then, then you do it and you go, oh man, I would. Or what we probably should say is, I wish I'd listened to advice. See, a long life. Living long on the earth comes from people being obedient to God because bad behavior will be punished. Maybe not by your parents. Frankly, there are some parents who don't seem to get the idea that they are God's instrument for disciplining bad behavior. I mean... So they raise the children to kind of go, well, I'm going to get to that in a little bit. But they raise children who, who don't quite get the thing of bad choice, bad consequence. So they grow up and they keep making bad choices and all of a sudden the bad consequences start coming. Children, your key is to obey and your key is to honor Well, I do want to, I, I, even if I want to come back to it later, I, I do want to, I, I want to think about verse 4. It is really where I'd like to spend some time. 
The first thing I want you to notice about verse 4 is the very first word. It says, fathers. Please notice it does not say parents. Again, I love commentators. I love the commentators who say, well, the word here is fathers, but it really means parents. It's like, hello. I think Paul knew the word for parents. And in the context, he's already mentioned parents. Verse 1, he's already referenced mothers and fathers. Verse 2, so if he really wanted to have the focus on parents, then verse 4, he would have repeated the word and said, parents. But he doesn't. So now this is my pre-Father's Day, Father's Day message. Huh. Because dads, this is written to us. Now don't misunderstand me, ladies. It's not like you can check out on me right now. You can't start thinking about lunch or whatever you else you have planned for today. Because I think fathers are wise when they bring into the place of child rearing the mom. Okay? But I think the point is, and I think that's what Paul's getting at, is that you and I as fathers hold the ultimate responsibility. We are not allowed to say the children are the way they are because of their mother. We can't do that. Now they may be, we just can't use that as our excuse. I mean, uh, <clears throat> that was a little joke there folks, just to kind of keep a little bit light here. Because moms and dads both impact their children, but the point is, is that we as dads, this is really on us. And I want you to notice what it says. Stop provoking your children to anger. I don't know about anybody else, but it sure seems to me that the longer I have lived, the more angry the generations coming after me have become. I, I, I'm just, I mean, and, and we can blame it on a lot of things. I'm going to give you ten things Actually, I have an 11th that I added, so. So let me ask the question, and then I'm going to answer it very quickly before I move on, because I promised you we would do this today. Let's ask the question, what do I have to do to raise an angry child? Oh, by the way, just before we do that, turn over to the book of Colossians, our parallel passages in the book of Colossians, and look at Colossians chapter 3. In Colossians chapter 3 and down at verse 20 and 21, Paul says to the Colossians in a parallel passage, Children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well pleasing the Lord. Fathers, stop exasperating your children so that they will not lose heart. It's a little bit different of a way, but it has the same idea. If we raise angry children, they have no hope for their future. I only have 10 minutes, so I'm gonna I'll list them and if I if I want I'll come back to them later. Let me give you one way you can raise an angry child by unreasonable or unrealistic demands. Unrealistic or unreasonable demands. You cannot expect your two-year-old to do what a ten-year-old is supposed to do. There is a difference between rebellion and an accident. Your two-year-old is sitting at the table and in front of him sits a glass of whatever. Because we're all healthy around here, a glass of milk. Instead of, you know, sugared up... Uh, uh, whatever. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. Anyway, he's got his glass sitting there, okay? And your two-year-old, because he's two, he's learning how to drink without a sippy cup, by the way. Just a regular old cup, okay? 
And he reaches up to grab it, and because he's not really overly coordinated, he knocks it over. You punish him for that? Some parents would. Oh my goodness, some parents would just go ballistic that the kid spilled his milk. Now, if the kid went like this, <laughs> okay, that's different, all right? That is rebellion, okay? Some two-year-olds will do that, okay? But some two-year-olds, because they're not quite coordinated, they reach up there and they go to grab it and they just knock it over. It was an accident. You know what you do? You go get the paper towels, you clean it up, and then you train on how to better grab your cup. But if you have an unreasonable demand that you expect a two-year-old to be like a ten-year-old, don't you ever shut up. Two-year-olds don't. You know what I'm saying? Now, again, don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying you, you give them carte blanche. I hope you understand that. There are times when two-year-olds need to learn to just be quiet. But anyway, unreasonable demands. If you're unreasonable, if you're unrealistic, if you set demands on your children that are beyond their capability, you'll raise an angry child because they can never meet your demands. Number two, arbitrary or petty rules. Arbitrary or petty rules. Here's what an arbitrary rule is. You come home from work and little Junior is sitting on the floor in the living room playing with Legos, having a great time making all kinds of noise. And you walk in, you're just, oh, that's so cute. Uh, oh, Junior, you're doing such a great job. Oh, that is so wonderful. But you come in, that's because you had a good day at work. Now, if you come in tomorrow and you had a bad day at work, your boss yelled at you, your computer crashed on you, you just fought traffic worse than you've ever seen it before in your life, and you walk in and Junior's on the floor playing with his Legos, making the same noise he did before, and you go, what is wrong with you? Can't you be quiet? The kid says, uh, yesterday it was okay. Why did the rule change today? It's arbitrary because you didn't want to hear him today. You keep that up, you'll raise an angry child. Because again, he doesn't know what day it is. Did dad have a, mom or dad have a good day coming home? Did everything go well at school? Because if it did, then I can still have fun. But if it didn't, I mean, you're going to raise an angry child. Number three. Hmm. Favoritism. Can we say Jacob? Not Gilliam, by the way. <laughs> I mean, can we say coat of many colors? I mean, if you want to raise an angry child, you show one of the siblings more love than you do to them. Always talk about them. Isn't Johnny so wonderful? And you're an idiot. <laughs> he is so good. He can play sports. He knows everything about the theory of relativity. And you don't even know your name. You know, I mean, if you show favoritism, you'll raise an angry child. And I mean, I know I'm trying to make a little bit light of some of this because I want you to stay with me here, okay? But it's not a laughing matter. I've seen parents. It is so obvious. Now my five children, well, two of them are here and the other three are probably listening in. <laughs> but anyway, they, they might tell you a different story, but uh, uh, I, I don't think we played favorites. Now some of our kids were just better than others, but I mean, uh, they were just, that's just, I mean, that, I mean, there is a fact of truth and error, but I mean, anyway, but you get my point. Listen, if you actually treat one in a completely different way than you do the others, or two out of the three, or whatever, you're going to raise an angry child. Because again, they're going to say, well, pff, I must not be worth anything. They don't really care about me. Number four, I'll guarantee you, you will raise an angry child if you neglect them. I don't know if in all of my list and in all the things that I think about as far as parenting, I don't know if I could put them in a 1 to 10, top 1 to 10 or whatever, but if I were to do that, 
would seem like this one would be at the top two or three. Neglect. You come home. Now, here, here's the deal. 30 years ago, it's the dad who came home trying to, trying to set this up. Okay. So it's the dad who came home, said hi. This is a newspaper, okay? We don't have those anymore. <laughs> anyway, he'd sit there. Is it dinner yet? Okay. What? No, I, I, I'm reading my newspaper. The father who on Saturday, when he could spend some time with his children, decided that he had three or four or five other things he needed to do. Neglect. I remember a story many years ago that affected my, I hope at least, at least I think it did, affected my parenting. I heard a pastor tell a story that he was in a study one day and he was deep in thought like pastors are, you know. And um, he, was, he was going, and all of a sudden his door opened and his little kid came running in, Daddy, Daddy! And he said, he looked up, he said, What are you doing in here? You can't come in here like this. I, I am busy. You need to go. And he said the little kid turned on his heels and got to the door, turned back and looked at him and said, I bet you wouldn't have done that if I'd been a member. Father said he immediately broke down, called his little boy over to him, put him on his lap, said, you're right. He said, I realized that I, was make, I would make time for other things and other people but not my own kids. I've said this to parents all the time. I tried to say it to myself too. And now that I'm old, I know it's very true. Listen, listen. Childhood only comes once. You can't go back. You can't go back. Once it's over, it's over. Can I tell you something, parents, especially you that have little kids? Get on the floor with them. Get into their world. Play with them. Talk with them, not to them. Show them that you really love them and care for them. Now, if you talk with them, you might have some really interesting conversations. <laughs> His kids are, I mean, we all know that, right? It was Art Linkletter who had the first one, and then I think uh, kids say the darndest things. Wasn't it Art Linkletter? Yeah, some of us that are old remember him. The rest of you are going, Art Linkletter, <laughs> who is he? Um, anyway, the kids can. I told you before, I'll just say it again. I, it's part of my joy on Tuesday nights, man. I, my kids are all grown. They don't all say dumb things anymore, but uh, I love spending my time with Cooper in the car. Yesterday I took him out to his, uh, to his little golf lesson. And he and I, you know, it's the whole convertible thing, I've told you that. And let me tell you something, it's, it, there are just, it's a fun time to be on Highway 280, going 65, thank you, going 65, with the top down. <laughs> Cooper, how is it back there? Okay, Grandpa, I can't hardly hear you. Yeah, I know. Well, it's bad, isn't it? You know, and so I, it's only a couple more miles. You know, then we finally pull off and uh, then it all gets quiet again. But I'm telling you, I, I, when I used to have my own kids, I, I'm telling you, that I miss that. That's why I'm thrilled that I have grandkids I can do it with, then send them home. <laughs> Listen, if you neglect your kids, you'll raise an angry child because they don't know what it takes to get your love. They, they, they don't get it. It's like, well, well, he, I see him with that person and that person. All right, number five. I guess I'm only going to get to my first five. Sorry. I've already said petty rules, unreasonable demands, and that stuff. But, and, and this one, you're going to say, well, it's the same thing, and it kind of is, but I'm going to say it a little differently. Inconsistent discipline. Arbitrary rules and inconsistent discipline are basically the same but again, inconsistent discipline. 
Now, this can not only relate to one day you come home and Johnny's doing whatever and you think it's funny, then the next day you come home and you had a bad day and you don't think it's funny. But here's the other way inconsistent discipline works. Dad says, dot, dot, dot. But mom says, comma, comma, comma. And the kid says, whoo, who do I obey? And let me tell you something. Kids come with a radar built in. And it does this. Who do I need to talk to to get my way? Do, 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 do. Dot, dot, dot. Dad, can I do this? Sure, no problem. <laughs> and of course they don't say, I just talked to mom and she said no. You know. I mean, now if it's the comma, 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 it'd be do, 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 comma, 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 good, okay, good. And then dad doesn't know. See, mom and dad, you got to be locked in. Dad, you can't let something go on that mom has already said they can't. That's called inconsistent discipline, and I'll guarantee you, you'll raise an angry child. Because they'll do it, and if it's something mom said not to do and they do it, they'll be disciplined by mom and dad the whole time. be going, what is wrong with you? It's okay. I told him it was okay. Whew. That is not a good scenario. Okay, so I'm going to leave the last five, actually six, for next week. So you have to tune in next week. Sorry, I, I, I guess I did lie. I said I was going to give you all ten. But actually, I want to spend a little more time with that. But do you get the idea, parents? Listen, we, if, if God has privileged us to bring children into this world, and God has blessed us with that, then it is our responsibility to raise them to love and honor God. Of course, that, we're going to talk about that too. What's your goal in parenting? I mean, again, we, we just, sometimes we forget. I'm going to end with this just in case you're not back next week because I thought this was a great, I, I just thought this was a, a good way to end. Listen to this story. It's a, it's a little like fable story. Once upon a time, there was a man who worked very hard just to keep food on the table for his family. This particular year, a few days before Christmas, he punished his little five-year-old daughter after learning that she had used up the family's only roll of expensive gold wrapping paper. As money was tight, he became even more upset when on Christmas Eve, he saw that the child had used all the expensive gold paper to decorate one shoebox she had put under the Christmas tree. He also was concerned about where she had gotten money to buy what was in the shoebox. Nevertheless, the next morning, the little girl, filled with excitement, brought the gift box to her father and said, This is for you, Daddy. As he opened the box, the father was embarrassed by his earlier overreaction, now regretting how he had punished her. But when he opened the shoebox, he found it was empty. And again his anger flared. Don't you know, young lady, he said harshly, when you give someone a present, there's supposed to be something inside the package. The little girl looked up at him with sad tears rolling down her eyes and said, Daddy, it's not empty. I blew kisses into it until it was full. The father was crushed, fell on his knees and put his arms around his precious little girl. He begged her to forgive him for his unnecessary anger. An accident took the life of that little child a short time later. It is told that the father kept this little gold box by his bed for all the years of his life. Whenever he was discouraged or faced difficult problems, he would open the box, take out the imaginary kiss, and remember the love of this beautiful child who had put it there. See, you got to have the long view. And parents, we have been there. I know how long those days can feel. I know there are times that you think, are we ever going to get through it? All I ask you to do is, as the songwriter said a number of years ago now, love them while you can. Let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning because you have bestowed upon us a love that is beyond our understanding and you as our heavenly Father have promised to never leave us nor forsake us. I thank you that you have loved us when we were unlovable and unloving and 
You have bestowed great grace upon us. May we as moms and dads, especially we as fathers, may we demonstrate a love to our children that will go beyond just the, maybe the hurt and the pain of the day. Father, build within our lives, into our church, into, into believers' families, a way to demonstrate grace in a world that has gone so far away from you. So this morning, Lord, as we just sing a song and get ready to go home, may we stay committed to wanting to honor you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.